الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده ما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى this morning our talk is going to be surrounding العلم وأهميته knowledge and its importance. Uh, before we begin, <coughs> so that there's no uh, misunderstanding, we need to clarify knowledge as is defined in the text of the Kitab and the Sunnah. What is it? Because there are different types of knowledge. So some, there's knowledge of biology, there's knowledge of mathematics, there's knowledge of space, stars, and, you know, astrophysics, and all these different things. That's, that's knowledge. No one can deny that that is a type of knowledge. However, what is the knowledge that when Allah Ta'ala mentions it in the Quran or when the Prophet وسلم, that he mentions it uh, in his sunnah, what is this knowledge? What is it referring to? So we look, uh, we have a, a definition that was given to us by Al Imam Ibn Qayyim, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, where he said, Al Ilmu qala Allah, qala Rasuluhu, qala Sahabatu, hum ulul irfani, mal ilmu nasbaka li khilafi safahata. Ibn al-Qayyim ta'ala, he said, knowledge is what Allah said and what his prophet said or what his messenger said and what the Sahaba said. They are the people who understand. They are the people of knowledge. Knowledge is not foolishly setting up differences of opinion between the messenger and the thoughts or ideas of so and so. So here, Ibn al Qayyim rahimahullah is very clearly establishing what is meant or what is knowledge and how it is defined. So let's take a look at what he says. He says, Knowledge is what Allah said, what the Prophet said, what the Sahaba said. That's knowledge. And so when we talk about knowledge or the people of knowledge, the, the ulama, the scholars, the, the scholars are those who have knowledge. This is, those are the people who, who know what Allah said, what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and what the Sahaba said. What the Sahaba said is ref in reference to defining and interpreting what Allah said and what the Prophet said. Because they are the ones who were actually present when this revelation was being revealed. They were the ones who were present when the Prophet وسلم, said what he said, what he did, what he did. They witnessed it with their eyes. So who is it that's better to interpret for us the revelation of Allah, or the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, than the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like Abu Bakr and Umar, Uthman and Ali, Ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Abbas and so on and so forth. So this is knowledge. This is knowledge. So from this point or from this place is where we're going to have the discussion surrounding knowledge and the importance of knowledge. Because this is what is meant by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala when he speaks about knowledge in the Quran or when the Prophet ﷺ speaks about knowledge uh, in his sunnah. <coughs> and so the, the first thing we have to understand about knowledge is that knowledge is where all things begin from the religious standpoint, from the religious aspect. Knowledge is from where all things begin. Because our deen, our practice, our worship 
is necessity that it is built upon knowledge. Because if our if if our intention is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if our intention is to please Allah, then we have to do so with what Allah is pleased with. I don't know if that makes sense. What's your name? I'm sorry, I speak loud. Suleiman. Suleiman, let me say that again for you, okay? If our intention is to please Allah through our worship, paying attention, Suleiman? Okay, make sure you're paying attention. If our intention is to please Allah, then we have to please Allah with what Allah is pleased with. Not with what pleases us. And there at times can be a difference. There at times can be a difference because there are instances where we may do something because it's something that we like, something that we enjoy, something that we ourselves want that may not necessarily be what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. I'll give a religious example. Let's say a person wants to go make hajj. Everyone wants to go make hajj. I'm sure there's some people here who have made hajj and some people here who have not. Those who have not made hajj, I'm sure that you want to make hajj. You have a desire, a longing to make hajj. Some, some of you may even dream about hajj. You may even turn on the TV channel. You pay extra money for the Saudi channel just so that you can watch the Mu'tamirin you know, going around and making tawaf, right? You have it playing on your TV. Just, you want to be close to the Kaaba, and if that's all you have, that's all you have. So now, now this year comes around and you have some money. Right, you have a little bit of money. And you say, you know what, I'm gonna take this money and I'm gonna make, go make hajj. But then, you have Brother Tanbir, who's such a nice guy, and he loans everybody money, right? Comes up and he says, hey, I heard you got some money. Um, I need my money back. So now you have an option. You can give all your money that you were gonna use to make hajj with and turn it over to the Tanbir. And now you're starting off at ground zero again because now you don't have any more money. Or you can tell Tanbir, oh, I'm miskeen, give me some more time, I'm gonna go make hajj. Now, what would we want to do? If a person's never made hajj, what would we want to, our heart would tell us to do what? Huh? Go to hajj. But what should we do? Pay off the debt. That's what we should do. That's, our, that's what's obligatory for us to do. And so in this case, what we should be doing is different than what we want to do. And if we left it up to our desires, then we would go make hajj. We would go make hajj. Believing and thinking that we are doing good. Which I'm not saying that making hajj is not good. But now, in order for us, when we get into these situations and scenarios, in order for us to do what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to choose with what Allah is most pleased with. And the only way that we're going to know what Allah is most pleased with is if we have knowledge. What did Allah say? What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? How did the Sahaba interpret it and understand it and implement it? This is how we get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, he says in the Qur'an, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tuqaddimu bayna yaday illahi wa rasuli. O you who have believed, do not supersede Allah and his messenger. This is the first ayah from Surah Al-Hujurat. Anybody know? What surah number is Surah Al Hujurat? What surah number is Surah Al Hujurat? 49. 
We're gonna stop letting you answer, Reza. Because you gotta give us time and, and, and you gotta give opportunity to other people, inshallah. So Janvier is now on the knockoff list. He's not, he's not allowed to answer questions for the next 10 minutes, inshallah. So yes, Surah Al-Hujurat is Surah number 49. What's the Surah that comes before it or the Surah that comes after it? So you're not allowed to answer. So Al-Fat, it comes after it. So Al-Fat comes after it? Al-Fat comes before and after it is Surah Al-Qaf. Very good. Very good. Alhamdulillah. So the first ayah from Surah Al-Hujurat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, O oh, you who have believed, do not supersede Allah and His Messenger. Now, an Imam al-Tabari, rahimahullah, he brings in his book of Tafsir, a narration from Ibn Abbas, anhumah, who said that this ayat means when Allah prohibits us from superseding Allah and His Messenger, Allah is prohibiting us from speaking before we know Allah's rule about that speech, or before acting before we know Allah's rule about that act. And so, essentially, when we speak and we say things and we don't know what the hukum of Allah is about that speech, or we go forward and we do something and we don't know the hukum of Allah as it relates to that action, then by doing so, we are superseding Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and thereby falling into what Allah Ta'ala has prohibited. What Allah Ta'ala has prohibited because we have acted or we have spoken without knowledge. And so it's extremely important for us to have this knowledge before we speak and before we act. Now when we look at Revelation, we look at Revelation when, when, when the Prophet Ali wasalam, when he was in the cave and Jibreel Salam first came to him and he revealed the opening revelation, the opening verses of revelation. Who knows which verses these were that Jibreel came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with first? Oh. Not Tanbir. No, 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 no. The, 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 we're going to abandon the whole family. <laughs> Who, who said that? MashaAllah. What's your name, Akhi? Firuz. Firuz, MashaAllah. Is this our first time meeting? No. No? I'm sorry. MashaAllah Ta'ala, we, we, we need to see each other more often, Shaykh. So, Firuz, you're absolutely right. Allah Ta'ala revealed the first ayat that Allah Ta'ala revealed to the Prophet وسلم, was the statement, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Right? Actually, there were five verses. There were five verses. So, do you know the five verses? Does anybody else know? Huh? It's your dad? No? Where's your dad? Is he here? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. So, you can, you're not allowed to answer me. We said the whole, the whole family's all, oh, not gone. So why are you not sitting next to your dad? Oh, you, you're mad at him. Okay. We'll talk about that later, inshallah. Anybody know the five verses? This is, okay, yes. Mm -hmm. So in these five verses are very important about our, and it relates to our discussion. The reason why I'm mentioning these verses is because the first thing that, the first command that Allah Ta'ala revealed to the Prophet وسلم, was Iqra, read, right? So Allah Azza wa Jal, the first piece of revelation which contained the first command was to read, was to read. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala in Tanna, he, he showed his favor over mankind by explaining that he is the one who taught the usage of the pen. Right? Because how do we read? We read things that people write. 
right? So we writing is a, a, a is part of the process of reading. And Allah Ta'ala, He shows His favor on mankind by showing that He is the one who taught the usage of the pen. And He said that He is the one who taught man that which He knew, that which He knew not. He taught man that which He didn't know. And so we look, the beginning of revelation is a command to read and Allah showing His favor that over mankind, that he taught them. That he taught them knowledge. And so this revelation began with knowledge. The revelation is it, it the, the revelation is knowledge in of itself. And it began by commanding with knowledge. And Allah showing favor over the Prophet and the rest of mankind, that Allah Ta'ala has taught mankind knowledge. And so this is important because our religion, our, our journey, our practice, our worship, all is based upon knowledge. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and how the Sahaba understood and interpreted. Inshallah ta'ala, we, we'll wait till we'll do another class because some people may wonder, how do we, how do we get the Sahaba in, into this, uh, where do they come in? There's evidences to prove this, but that's that's a different discussion for a different day, inshallah ta'ala. I promise we'll, we'll get to that. We'll do a whole lesson on that by itself, uh, inshallah ta'ala. Now, this knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown us that this is the pathway to righteousness. This is the pathway to righteousness. Because as we said, in order to practice what Allah is pleased with, we have to know what Allah is pleased with. And this knowledge, it will save us. Not only it will get us to Jannah as the pathway to Jannah, but it's also, it serves as our protection from the hellfire. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Mulk, anybody know? Questioning everyone. We're going to wake everyone up this morning. It's cold outside. Uh, so if I got to be awake, we're all going to be awake, inshallah. So, Surah Al Mulk is what Surah number? 67. 67, mashallah. What's the Surah that comes after it? Yeah, in the back, yes. Surah Al Qalam. Very good. Surah Al Qalam. Now, so in Surah Al Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about the people of the hellfire. Allah Ta'ala, he talks about the people of the hellfire. And that he mentions that uh, there's a statement that they're going to make once they are in the hellfire. وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُوا أَوْ نَعْقِلُوا مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ Allah says, they will say, meaning the people of the fire, they will say, had we listened or understood, then we would not have been the people of the fire. If we would have listened, and listened to what? If we would have listened to revelation, and if we would have listened, if we would have lent an ear and listened to the book that Allah revealed, and the speech, the da'wah of the Prophet wasallam, if we would have listened we would not have been from the people of the fire. Meaning that the reason why these, and this is the, this is, this is the statement of the people of the fire themselves. This is what Allah is telling us that the people of the fire, this is what they're going to say. If we would have just listened, then we would not be people of the fire. Meaning if they would have listened, or well, the reason why they are in the fire is because of their turning away or their ignoring of the revelation. I mean, they didn't know. And they didn't know because they were willfully ignorant. They didn't know because they were willfully ignorant, which is, there's a difference between simple ignorance and willful ignorance. And some people will say, well, if I'm ignorant, then Allah doesn't hold us accountable for things we don't know. You say, yes, that is true to a certain extent. It is only true 
that Allah will overlook and forgive you for your ignorance only to a certain extent. Because there are things that you can know and there are things that you should know. And if you don't know, then Allah is going to hold you accountable for it. So for example, if a person comes and he says, well, I don't know how to pray, so I guess I can't pray. I don't know what time Salat al-Fajr is. I guess I can't pray Fajr, right? Will we accept that excuse? Would you accept to say, hey, you know, Suleiman, where were you for Salat al-Fajr? He said, well, I didn't, I didn't know how to pray Fajr. I don't know what time Fajr is. I don't know the rules of Fajr. So I didn't pray Fajr. I wouldn't accept that. I would not accept that. I'm sure his father wouldn't accept that either. It's unacceptable. You say, listen, Ghulam, did you pay your zakat this year? You say, Shaykh, I, I don't I don't know how to pay zakat on 401k. I don't know zakat on stocks. I don't know on gold. I don't know. So I didn't pay it. It's unacceptable. That is unacceptable. Because it is an obligation upon you to perform certain practices which necessitates that you learn how to perform those practices. So ignorance is not an excuse when it comes to willful ignorance. A person who intentionally turns away from knowledge. We have books, alhamdulillah, with all kinds of knowledge on the shelf. We pass by these books every day. They're accessible. They're free. It's free to come into the mission and sit in the musalla and read. No one's stopping you. No one is putting a, a toll or a tax on you. So it's accessible. So why don't we know? And we're going to have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. Just like these individuals that Allah ta'ala spoke about. That they said, had we listened, had we listened, had we learned, had we understood that we would not be from the people of the fire. So this shows us the importance of learning, the importance of us having knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He showed us, or He mentioned to us in the Quran, all throughout the Quran, that He taught the prophets. The prophets and messengers were people of knowledge. And Allah showed His favor upon those prophets by teaching them. And He informed us of his favor over the prophets by telling us that he's the one who taught them. We start with Adam, alayhi salam. Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Quran, with qala rabbuka lil malaikati inni ja'ilu fil ardi khalifa. And when your Lord said to the angels, I'm placing a khalifa in the earth, the angel said, are you going to place in the earth someone who's going to uh, shed blood, we praise you and we glorify you. Allah said to them and responded to them, I know that which you know not. I know what you don't know. Right? I know what you don't know. And then what happened? Allah Ta'ala says, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا And he taught Adam the names of everything. Then he taught Adam, he taught Adam the names of everything. Then he presented these things to the malaika. He said to the angels, tell me the names of these things. Tell me the names of these things. The angels said, glory to you. We only know that which you taught us. So Allah then says, He said, Adam, inform them of, their, of these names. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He showed the angels his favor over our father Adam and mankind by showing that he taught he taught Adam knowledge that he didn't teach the angels. He taught Adam knowledge that he didn't teach the angels. And this was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favoring Adam alayhi salam. He ordered the angels to prostrate to Adam. And at that time this was a, a form of breeding. For, and as a, as, a, as a way of showing 
the, uh, the status and the superiority of Adam over the angels. And this is why Iblis refused to prostrate. He said, why? Because he said, I'm better than him. He said, I'm not prostrating. I mean, I'm not going to show this level of respect and humility. I'm not going to elevate him above me because I'm better than him. And so this shows us that Allah Ta'ala favored Adam salam over the angels by teaching him knowledge. Um, now there, Allah mentions prophets and messengers all in between. And there's ayat that mention how Allah Ta'ala has taught them all. So, but we mentioned specifically Adam and we mentioned the last and final prophet and messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Ta'ala, he said, uh, he said to him, uh, in Surah An-Nisa, does anybody know what Surah number Surah An-Nisa is? Yes, in the back. Yes. Four. You're absolutely right. What is your name? Yusuf. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, Yusuf, and your parents. Everybody say Amin. No. Now, so in Surah number four, which is Surah An Nisa, Surah An Nisa, Allah Ta'ala says, Wa anzal Allah wa alayka al kitab wa al hikmata wa alamaka ma lam takun ta'ala. Wa kana fadlu Allah alayka alima. Allah Ta'ala says, And Allah has descended or has sent down to you the book, the wisdom, and He taught you that which you didn't know. And the fadl of Allah and the bounty of Allah over you is glorious, is magnificent, is great. And so Allah Ta'ala, I wanted to mention that Allah differentiated between the book and the hikmah. Allah says in this ayah, وَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And Allah has uh, sent down to you the book, which is what? The Qur'an. The book that Allah sent down to the Prophet وسلم, is the Qur'an. I tell you, if I have to be awake, and we all have to be awake. The Qur'an. But what is the hikmah that was revealed by Allah? It's the sunnah. The sunnah of Allah's Prophet وسلم, we have to understand. It's very, very important for us to understand this concept. I know it's, it's simple for us to say, but it's extremely important for us to understand that the sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, was is revelation. The sunnah is revelation. Because Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Quran that the Prophet وسلم, did not speak from his own desires. It is only revelation that is revealed to him. He speaks revelation. He speaks revelation. So when the Prophet وسلم, when he says, Actions are based upon intention. That's revelation that he's speaking. That's revelation that he's speaking. When the Prophet وسلم, he said, that the, the buyer and the seller, they are under option. They have the option to, to agree or to disagree as long as they don't separate. That's revelation. The Prophet وسلم, he said that, but he was taught that. He didn't say that just from making it up out of his own head. He didn't say that from his own desires. He was taught that. This is the wisdom that Allah Ta'ala has revealed. And in this ayah from Surah An-Nisa, Allah says, and Allah revealed to you he sent down to you the book and the wisdom. And he taught you that which you didn't know. He taught you that which you didn't know. And then he says, وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا And so in the, in the bounty of Allah over you is magnificent. And so Allah is showing the Prophet wasallam that this revelation, that this book that has been revealed to him, this sunnah that has been revealed to him, and the knowledge that was taught to him is a fadl from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is azim. It is great and it is magnificent. And so every single portion, every single portion of the book 
and of the wisdom that we learn is a portion of the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is magnificent. You learn one verse. You learn one verse. Is someone trying to turn on? Huh? Yeah, is someone trying to AC on? It's, if, if somebody's hot, we, all we need to do is open the windows. It's, it's 20 degrees outside. <laughs> MashaAllah. Uh, Maybe they meant to turn the heat on. Testing your sleeping or <laughs> yeah, they said, wake up, wake up. <laughs> so I know what to get them up. Uh, every single port, every single verse of the Quran that you memorize, if you learn one hadith from the Prophet وسلم, is a bounty from Allah, is a portion of Allah's bounty. And that, that bounty is magnificent and is great. The bounty is great. And uh, it was last week, I keep forgetting the Sheikh's name, Mubin, right? Mubin. Sheikh Mubin, he, he brought to our attention uh, the verse where Allah Ta'ala mentions, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعَ مِنَ الْمَثَانِ وَالْقُرْآنِ الْعَظِيمِ And we gave you the seven often recited verses and a glorious Qur'an, right? That verse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favor or showed his favor to the Prophet وسلم, once again by informing him of what he has revealed to him. And then opposite of that he said, And don't extend your eyes to what we have given some of them as enjoyment of the life of this world. And so this shows us that the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it relates to what he has revealed. <coughs> That bounty is greater than the bounty of gold and silver. Because the true bounty of Allah Ta'ala is when Allah has taught you that which you didn't know. Taught you knowledge that you didn't know. And I'm not referring to knowledge of, uh, of astrophysics and mathematics. I'm talking about the knowledge of what Allah says and what Allah has revealed from the book and the wisdom. Because Allah Ta'ala, as it shows here in this surah, Allah Ta'ala... He, he'll give the dunya to anybody. He gave the dunya to Fir'aun. Fir'aun was rich and powerful. He gave the dunya to Qarun. Uh, 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 he, they were, people were rich and powerful. They had money, they had wealth. Right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not show his favor simply by giving someone gold and silver because Allah has given Kufar, gold and silver. But he's only given the righteous revelation. He's only given the righteous the book and wisdom. And so, if we're going to be spending our time engaged in and, and trying to seek out Allah's bounty, then we should be engaged in seeking out the bounty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that it is a great and magnificent bounty. And so, as we mentioned, knowledge is where everything begins as it relates to us getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowledge is where everything begins. Because ignorance is unacceptable. Ignorance is unacceptable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, بَلْ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْحَقِّ فَهُمْ مُعْرِضُونَ Rather, most of them don't know the truth, so they turn away. And so here, Allah Ta'ala is, is showing us in this verse that people, part of the reason why, or one of the reasons why they turn away from the truth and leave the path of truth is because they don't know. And when you don't know, Meaning when you're ignorant and you don't have knowledge, then this is a reason for a person to leave the path of truth. And so this is why it's important for us as men, the leaders of our community, we have to have knowledge. We have to have knowledge. Because 
the future of our community, which is our young people, Yusuf, Suleiman, and, and the others, in order for them to stay on the path of truth, they have to have knowledge. And we have to teach them. Our children, we impress upon them, you have to do good in your studies. You have to do good in your studies in high school, math, and science. And I'm, and I'm all for that, alhamdulillah, right? Because you got to get accepted to a good college, Penn State, you know, Brown, or NJIT. You need to be an engineer. You need to be a doctor. You need to, you need to, you need to. Okay, no problem. Problem is that we don't have Islamic universities here in this country, not yet anyway. So if our child goes to university, they're going to go to Rutgers, right? They're going to go to NYU, they're going to go to Penn State, or they're going to go to one of these types of universities. And when they get there in their first year, the very first semester, what are they teaching them? Liberal arts. What is liberal arts? Right? It's a bunch of philosophy teaching psychology, which is a bunch of philosophy. It's these these philosophers, um, Maslow and, and, and Sigmund Freud and all of these guys, and they're thinking. This is what they're learning in the first year. If our children, now they're from high school, now they're going to college and they're beginning their adult life, okay? If they're not fortified with knowledge, how do they defend their own hearts? I'm not saying they stand up to defend Islam in the classroom. I'm saying how do they defend and protect their own hearts from being infected with this philosophy? If they don't know who Allah is, right? If you ask, who was Allah? I don't know. And I think I told you all before that there was a, 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 a teenager who my wife was teaching. And when she came to kind of evaluate her, to kind of see where her level was, the first question my wife asked her was, uh, who is Allah? She said, uh, Prophet Muhammad. And, you know, that shows us that, you know, there is a level of ignorance in our ummah that needs to be addressed. Because that teenager, if she grows up and goes on, inshallah she'll go on to do big things uh, in her education. But you imagine if someone like that goes to the university and meets a professor, PhD in philosophy and all these other accolades in, 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 in all these different areas. How, how hard would it be for that person who is specialized in Western philosophy to turn that person away from Islam and into disbelief. We don't know who Allah is. We don't know the Prophet ﷺ. We don't know Islamic history. There's accusations all over YouTube. Prophet Muhammad did this, he said this, he did this, he did this. We don't know Sirah. How are you going to defend your heart against these accusations? And so, Allah Ta'ala says, بَلْ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْحَقِّ فَهُمْ مُعْرِضُونَ Rather, most of them, or a lot of them, don't know the truth, so therefore they turn away. So therefore, they turn away. And so my advice to myself and my advice to all of us is that we need to seek knowledge. We have to seek knowledge and we have to learn. And it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. I remember in 1998, I was in uh, a conference in Arlington, Texas. Uh, there were some people of knowledge, students of knowledge that had visited. One of them that was here, it was a sheikh, his name was Sheikh Ali Hassan al Halabi. May Allah have mercy on him. He passed away uh, recently. Uh, may Allah have mercy on him. Anyway, he came to the United States. And I was young, I was 20-something uh, years old. This is before I went to Medina. And so uh, the Shaykh, mashallah, was always messing with the people. And so I asked him, I said, Shaykh, you know, the scholars of the, of the past, they used to memorize the Quran when they were young, like when they were still, you know, children. Uh, I told him, I said, I don't, 
I didn't memorize the Quran. Uh, I don't speak Arabic. Um, do you think that studying and learning is something that I should do? Or maybe I should strive in a different area to benefit the Muslims. The Shaykh said, uh, he said, uh, he said, there's a scholar in India, he didn't mention his name, he said, there's a scholar in India right now who didn't learn how to speak Arabic until after he was 50. And now he's from the major scholars. Now he's from the major scholars. <coughs> and so, and throughout the history of Islam, we've had scholars, big scholars that we know, uh, that didn't start their journey of, of, of learning until after they were older. Ibn Qayyim was actually a, a medical doctor when he started. Uh, Ibn Hazm, Rahimullah Ta'ala, uh, the great scholar of, of, uh, of Spain, he started as an adult. Actually, he got started, uh, his story is mentioned in his biography, that one day he came into the masjid and he uh, sat down before praying to Rakha. And uh, someone told him, Ahi, you can't sit down in the masjid uh, before you pray to Rakha. So he said, okay. So some time passed, he came back in the masjid one day again, and he, before he sat down, he prayed to Rakha. And so someone came to him and said, Ahi, you can't uh, pray to Rakha right now. It's not permissible. So he's frustrated. So I sit down, you tell me I can't sit. So I pray, and you tell me I can't pray. So he said, you know what? I'm gonna go learn for myself. And so he went and he actually sought knowledge and he learned for himself and became one of the great scholars of Al-Islam. So it's not unobtainable. Knowledge is not for young people exclusively. Knowledge is not for young people exclusively. If you're older, I understand you have responsibilities, life is hectic, and you know when you're younger you can make tafarruf, meaning you can do only this and you don't have much responsibilities, I understand that. That's, uh, that's understandable. However, just because you're older doesn't mean that you can't learn something. Doesn't mean that you can't be taught something. And if we take the methodology of learning a little bit, at a time and moving forward with that, then we'll look and we see that there are 365 days in the year, right? So if every day we learn one piece of knowledge, then at the end of the year, how many pieces of knowledge will we have learned? 365. 365. At the end of two years, 700, around 700. Maybe you take a day off or two, right? Take a day off or two, right? We'll give you that. 700 pieces of knowledge. If we were to test you right now, in the last 30 years, in the last 30 years, on 700 pieces of knowledge, maybe we might be able to find you, maybe you might be able to come up with 700 pieces of knowledge, maybe you won't. But in two years, which you say, oh, two years, two years, which is not a lot of time. You can have, I read this time, which is 2024. And inshallah, if we make it to 2026, we can come back and sit back here and say, how many pieces of knowledge have you learned in the last two years? You said 700. That's a lot of knowledge. It's a lot. Three years, a thousand. Four years, 1,300. You see where I'm going with this? this by practicing uh, or by learning a little bit at a time, one piece of knowledge every day, you can accumulate over time, as long as you're being consistent, you can accumulate a lot of knowledge. And you'll benefit yourself and benefit your family. It'd be better for you to leave your son with a thousand pieces of knowledge than leaving your son with a thousand acres of land or a thousand pieces of gold. Because that knowledge is what will live on forever. You pass it down to your son, your, that son will pass it down to his son, that son will pass it down to his son, and so on and so forth. And this is how we leave the legacy. And so when we talk about knowledge, we're not talking about simply uh, young people 
going to South Africa or going to Egypt or going to Syria or going to different places to study. We're talking about all of us. Pick up a book and read it. Attend the lectures that we have at the masjid. Uh, if you don't like the masjid here, the lectures that Imam Abdullah Smith gives, okay, alhamdulillah, we'll, we'll talk to the other imams in the areas to set up lectures other places. We'll, the important, we need to learn. We need to learn how to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by learning what Allah said and learning what the Prophet said. And you'll find that a lot of the differences that take place in the masajid, <coughs> different opinions, this one saying this, we should do it this way, we should do it that way. No, we start Ramadan now, we start Ramadan tomorrow. Oh, 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 oh. we pray like this, put our hands like this, don't put our hands like this, right? All, all these differences that we're having, you'll find that if we just sit down and we ask, well, what did Allah say? <coughs> a lot, like, uh, Allah. You'll find that a lot, I'm not going to say all of them, but a lot of these differences will simply just go away. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِيهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Whatever you differ about, its ruling belongs to Allah. Meaning, you and I, we differ. You, you say black, I say white. You say black, I say white. You say, what did Allah say? Allah said gray. You say, oh, that's what Allah said? Oh, okay. Then it's gray then. Done. Differences are over. Right? And you see the differences between us will just start to fade away. Right? When we have knowledge. The problem is when we are differing and neither one of us, we have knowledge. Just what I think, what you think. And we're going to differ all day long. If it's based upon what I think, you have a, you have a different thought. You think, you know, it's too. I'm thinking it's too cold in here. Turn the AC off. You think, oh man, it's hot in here. Turn the AC on. Like, we'll never agree because we can't have the AC on and off at the same time, right? So is it going to be on? Or is it going to be off? The question, the answer to that question is not based upon what I think or what you think. The answer to that question is, well, what did Allah say? And having knowledge brings us together because we no longer differ because we all agree on the revelation. And so this knowledge is important. It solidifies us. And being able to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it solidifies our brotherhood between us. It solidifies the legacy that we leave behind for future generations. And so I advise myself and I advise all of us to learn as much as possible uh, and all we have to do is just start. Allah says, "One leisa lil insani illa ma Man only gets what he strives for. And so all we have to do is just start, and we put our trust in Allah and let Allah do the rest. So we're going to inshallah, we're going to stop here. There's a couple of minutes. Uh, we said what 7:30 is when this time comes. 7:34. 734? Okay, so we have six minutes. Uh, if anybody has any questions surrounding uh, this topic, inshallah, Taala will answer. Uh, any questions with the name time? Yes, sure. Yes, sir. First, what is your name? My name is Abdul Jalil. Abdul Jalil? Yes. Okay, how are you doing, Abdul Jalil? Yes. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Yes. No, 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 that's, if I said that, then I was mistaken. What I meant by that was the availability of, of Islamic universities like Rutgers, like Penn State. I mean, if we do have one or two, they're not at this level. They're not at the, that. That's what I meant. Allah Ta'ala knows best. And again, we, we're thinking of, uh, and, and, and also Islamic university, not just a university that teaches Islamic studies. Islamic universities, we need Islamic universities that are teaching engineering, that are teaching medicine, that are teaching uh, accounting, and these sciences as well. Because we're still in a phase where we are building Islamic universities that are just teaching Islamic studies. And so we need to be also in a phase where we're, we, we, want, to, we want our children to learn engineering, or to want to learn computer science, that we send them to the Islamic University of Piscataway. I graduated with a master's degree in 
the biomedical engineering from the Islamic University of Middlesex County, right? That was established by Suleiman, right? Dr. Suleiman, right? So that this is what we this is what I was referring to uh, when I made this statement, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. But JazakAllah khair. We do we do have. There are Islamic universities in the United States. There are several. There are several in person. There are several online. We do have that. It's not like the Muslims aren't working. Uh, alhamdulillah, the Muslims are working, uh, but there's still more uh, more work to be done. Barakallah. <coughs> Resources for seeking knowledge. So, um, the person who wants to seek knowledge should utilize every single resource that he has available to him or her. And so, what that would include are the people of knowledge in his local area. It would include uh, utilizing YouTube for lectures, it would include conferences uh, that, you know, when we have people of knowledge uh, coming into the area. It would include our cars that Allah has blessed us with because sometimes knowledge may not necessarily be right here in Piscataway. Knowledge may be in Edison, right? Knowledge may be in Newark, right? Or in Trenton. Right, so we may have to get in our cars and do a little driving. And that's okay. Because that's called sacrificing for knowledge. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us with Musa alayhi salam when he went to seek out Khidr. Right? He, he actually traveled. He, when he learned that there was someone out there that had knowledge that he didn't have, he gathered up his belongings and he went on a journey. And so all of these are resources that we should utilize to the best of our ability. But the first place that we start is we say, okay, my local masjid, what is available? What are, the, what are the subjects that I can learn in my local masjid? Who are the people of knowledge in my local masjid? Uh, is there someone who knows fara'id? Someone who knows the laws, the scholarly about the laws of inheritance? Is it people who know buyur? People who are knowledgeable about the laws of buying and selling? Who, who, who's available in my local masjid and, and what do they have to offer? And again, the people of knowledge don't necessarily always have to be the imam of the masjid. Doktor, fulan, ibn fulan. It doesn't necessarily always have to be doktor. Because you'll find, I, I found in Medina myself, some of the greatest benefits that I benefited from personally were people who weren't the ones with the big names. If we had shuyukh with big names, the big, big, big scholars, the big names, a lot of times they were hard to get to simply because that they were so busy. They had so many responsibilities, so many students. It was hard to be able to really, and, and, it, and when you did have an opportunity to ask them questions, you know, the answers were you know, not as extensive as you may have wanted because you had a hundred other people who had questions, right? And so, you don't necessarily, when, especially in the beginning, especially in the beginning, you don't necessarily need the biggest shaykh in the world in order to start seeking knowledge. You may need just someone who knows the ahkam and nuna sakina. Right? Someone who knows how to practice idram, how to practice, you know, these, you know, iklab and these rules of tajweed. That may be what you need to start with. Because if you don't know the rules of nuna sakina, then this is what I tell you, go, go find someone and learn that first, right? And you can find that in the community. It could be brothers sitting right here who don't have, they're not really doing much, they're not really that busy, and they can teach you. And so you learn who are the people around me, what are the skills they have, what are the, what are the pieces of knowledge that they have. And you go to them, you say, hey, I need you to teach me, I need you to teach me, I need you to teach me. And then you learn from this one, you learn from this one, until you've learned all the knowledge that you can learn from the local MCMC community, and then you move outwards, and then you move outwards, and then you move outwards. And so this, this is the uh, pathway to knowledge. And Khatib al-Baghdadi, rahimahullah, he says, <coughs> he has a book, it's called Rihnatu fi Talib al-Hadith, uh, Traveling for Seeking Hadith. And this was, this was the advice uh, that he gave 
which was to seek knowledge locally uh, before packing your bags to go seek it uh, internationally. Allah Ta'ala is best. Is it time? Yeah. If we have time. One more question. If, there's, if there is one, then we'll, then we'll end, inshallah. Uh, we see in our history there are individuals who became big scholars, but they were self taught and they read books and all. So, uh, I mean, in the times today, we see people reading books and they like to become sheikh or, or something. But, I mean, uh, what is more important in terms of, uh, is, it, is it right now, uh, you know, more important to study under a sheikh or? You all still see that you know, people who just read books and self talk themselves and self teach themselves. So the question is um, is it more important to be self taught by reading books uh, or is it more important to sit under a teacher? Um, I will say that, uh, that there has to be a combination of both. There has to be a combination of both. It is absolutely necessary for a person, especially in the beginning, to have a teacher especially in the beginning, uh, to have a teacher because uh, knowledge is a, is, a, is, a, is a sea that has no ending, okay? And so if a beginner just jumps in, he'll, he'll swim in all kinds of directions and not know where to go. And so especially in the beginning, uh, the student of knowledge, the person who's learning, I, I don't necessarily want to use the term student of knowledge because that may, you know, the person said, well, I'm not a student of knowledge. No, we're all students of knowledge, right? So the person who's learning, should have a teacher, should have a teacher, and that teacher will guide him and, and, and give him direction, okay? But, but this, that person learning should not solely rely just on that teacher. So there should be reading, you should be reading books, you should be watching uh, videos, you should be attending uh, lessons, like big lectures and conferences, and, and taking notes and writing things down. And then when he gets these pieces of information, pieces of knowledge from these books, he goes back to his teacher. He says, Sheikh, I read in this book, you know, I read in Tafsir Ibn Kathir, where Ibn Kathir said this. I understood this. Is my understanding correct? And the Sheikh will say, yes, you've understood correctly. Or he'll say, no, 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 no. That's not what he meant. Here, let me show you. Right? And so there's a combination of the two. And that's necessary. We don't rely only on self being self-taught by reading, and we don't rely only and put the burden of our education solely on the sheikh. No, we have to take charge of our education and be responsible for our education by reading and learning as much as we possibly can with what's available to us, and then we also take advantage of the people of knowledge that we have around us and so that they can give us guidance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. With that, we will.